Today, I'm diving into the world of aperitifs. I'll talk a bit about their history, how to enjoy them, and I'm going to provide a few key examples of the form. Sometimes you're going to eat a big meal, a great big honking feast of a thing, and the table is just dripping in rich European cooking and cured meats and cheeses, and you look at it and you've got to steal your nerve, lest the spread upon the table defeat you. Your stomach is in your throat as you slide your chair in, racing through your mind the thoughts, am I equal to this culinary beast? You start to panic, your palms sweat. You want to run and hide and go for a nice light salad, and that's where the aperitif enters play. A bit of French or Italian courage to get your nerve or appetite into shape for a big old meal. So what is an aperitif? It's a French word that comes from the Latin for to open. In this case, a meal. It comes from this very old idea that it would be a good idea to have something to excite the appetite before eating. So on the one hand, an aperitif is sort of a specific component of a meal. It's the original appetizer, actually. And as such, it could kind of be anything, right? Yes and no, because as early as the 5th century, an aperitif was strongly associated with the idea of an alcoholic beverage of some kind. We know this because Christian ascetic Diodotius of Photiki wrote, and I quote, People who wish to discipline the sexual organs should avoid drinking those artificial concoctions which are called aperitifs, presumably because they open a way to the stomach for the vast meal which is to follow. So drink aperitifs, I guess? I don't know. I'm not really sure what he was going for there. So an aperitif is something you drink before a meal, like a liquid alcoholic appetizer, to prepare you for the feast to come and also possibly to undiscipline your sexual organs or something. I'm not quite clear on the theologism at play here. As a result, there's a whole class of drinks that are broadly known as aperitifs. Uh, some of them are mixed, like a cocktail. Some of them come straight out of the bottle. I'm gonna spend the rest of this episode uh, taking a look at some key examples of aperitifs as kind of a primer course, but first, let's talk about one of the straight from the bottle varieties, House, who happen to have been good enough to sponsor this guide to aperitifs, so thank you, House. You know, House produces a delicious line of sustainable farm-to-table aperitifs. Personally, my favorite uh, so far has been Bitter Clove, but lately I'm not so sure. I might actually prefer Peach Passion Fruit. Later on in this episode, I'm going to taste a few of their offerings and we'll get to the bottom of it. In any event, I do actually love all of their bottles served pretty simply on the rocks. Uh, maybe with a twist, but probably not. And maybe with some club soda as a spritz, but also probably not. It's really hard to go wrong. House is, I think, the only aperitif that lists all the ingredients right on the bottle, and if that's important to you, well, there it is. They ship straight to your door, which I love, especially these days. You can order House for yourself or others right now, and you'll get 15% off of your order by using this code and clicking the link below, either in the video description or in the pinned comment. So thanks again, House. So I'm talking about aperitifs, and I think I should stop here and have a word about digestives as well. As you might have guessed, a digestive is served after a meal to aid in digestion, in the same way that an aperitif is served before a meal to aid in appetite development. The whole thing is just honestly very aristocratic. So, but what is the difference between a digestive and an aperitif? Well, by and large, your digestives are gonna be sweeter, heavier drinks. Aperitifs are gonna be lighter and drier drinks. And that's really about it. Um, that's, that's it, you know, a digestive is gonna follow kind of a dessert formula, and aperitif's gonna be kind of a, you know, uh, an, an appetizer. Right, so an aperitif is nachos grande, and a digestive is like a molten lava cake. That'll work. Yeah, that's the way you think of it. Let's, let's get into these aperitifs, okay? Vermouth, vermouth. Now I've got a whole episode on vermouth in the works, and I don't want to step on its toes too much, so we're gonna keep this brief, but suffice to say that from the middle of the 1700s on, uh, the region of Turin, Italy, started producing what would come to define vermouth. And I really should say redefine it from the earlier version that it is. And that definition is that vermouths are aromatized, fortified wines that have been flavored with a number of botanicals. Pretty simple. You'll hear people say that, oh, but vermouths have to have wormwood in them. That's why they're called vermouth. Vermouth. Wormwood. Uh, that is the old style of vermouths. They don't have to have wormwood. And I think that most of them these days don't. Over the years, a number of vermouths have emerged from red and sweet to clear and dry and also bitter variations. Regardless, all vermouths make a fine aperitif as well as a vital component in martinis and Manhattans, which I personally think are a bit boozy for an aperitif, but 
do fit the mold. They are aperitif cocktails. As I said, I've got another episode focusing entirely on vermouth in the works, so today I'm just going to take a look at, um, well, I was going to do just a single vermouth, actually. That's what my notes tell me, but I think I'm going to do two. I think we'll do two. One red, uh, you know, one white. Just keep it that simple. And going very middle of the road here, I've got this Martini and Rossi red, which I don't think has ever turned up on the show. I feel like there's probably a perception that I don't like it or something. It's fine. It's good vermouth. It's fine. Um, and I have a Noeli Pratt French Dry. I haven't opened either of these. I just picked them up, so there's zero chance of there being any oxidization here. Is it oxidization? Like it oxidizes? Or is it oxys... I don't know. I kind of wanted to go um, with a Carpano Red, honestly, uh, but I can't find that anywhere. They don't really carry that. There is, I want to say too, Carpano makes the very most famous vermouth that everybody loves these days, uh, Carpano Antica Formula. It's not actually a very traditional style of vermouth, even though, I mean, it might be an older recipe, but um, David Wondrich has some thoughts on this that I'm going to include the link to. It's a sp specific style of vermouth that is not actually indicative of the baseline Turin style of vermouth. I think it's like a, a vanillinated vermouth. It's, it's heavy on vanilla. It's got a lot of vanilla in the flavor profile, right? So uh, these two bottles we're gonna answer to all of vermouthdom as it pertains to its place in the world of the aperitif. Uh, vermouth is great on the rocks uh, with a twist of orange or without or any way you like it really. So let's have a taste here of these two guys. Uh, all on their own. We're just gonna have these neat. We're gonna have them just like you would a wine. And um, I might have to pause to clean these glasses because they might be a little dusty, and this one in particular is a little filthy. Just give me one second. Okay, we don't need to clean that glass anymore. Okay, here we go. So this is a, a red vermouth, also called a sweet vermouth. And this is a white vermouth, it's also a French vermouth. It has nothing to do, uh, it's a completely different tradition than the um, Turin tradition of vermouth. And the reason that I, uh, I'm including it is because we're talking about vermouths as an aperitif. It actually does not fit into this evolutionary history that we're talking about here. Um, so I, I don't want you to, to get confused. It's here because I kind of just feel like I, I, people are going to complain if I don't do a white vermouth when I do vermouth, right? There's a lot of styles of vermouth, right? There's your baseline too, or your red and, and your, your sweet and your dry, right? But there's also... Blanco, which is a white and sweet vermouth. Okay, here we go. Turin style martini and Rossi vermouth. That is actually really good. What is that flavor? Oh, that's lovely. Sage, maybe? Rosemary. It's got a lot of rosemary going on in it. It's rosemary like crazy. I was. It's sweet, but not very, very sweet. If it was too sweet, you know, this would be a digestive instead of an aperitif. A little bit sweet, a lot of rosemary. Um, and, and mildly bitter, not like, not like a quinine, like a tonic bitter, but like, it's a little bit bitter. It's great. <laughs> it tastes a bit like a savory bit of chicken or something, honestly, with all that rosemary. <laughs> um, okay. Here we do the white. I'm sorry, not the white, the dry. This is from the French tradition. Ooh. It's basically just tastes like a, a very mild dry white wine. No sweetness really to speak of. A slightly bitter kind of aftertaste. I mean, it's pretty mild, in, by, certainly in comparison to this. This has kind of a lot of flavor. This has the volume turned way, way down. It's also, from, like I said, a completely different thing. It's not the same thing. I mean, it is the same thing. They're both vermouths, but they're both ar aromatized. Is it aromatized or aromatized? Aromatize. Aromatized. I don't know how to pronounce that. Aromatized fortified white wines, which means they make wine. Uh, somehow or another, they get their flavors infused into it and they add some, um, uh, generally like a low grade brandy. Uh, they just take some, some, when you're making the wines, you have some that's going to make good vermouth and some of it, you, you look at the cask and you say, this is going to be bad vermouth. And they take it and they throw that into a still. Um, and then that's what you do the fortification with. The, the, the things that make for good base wines are not really that important. Uh, after it goes through a still, if that makes any sense. Uh, don't, nobody, still don't care. Yeah, okay, vermouths. And now I think it makes sense to move on to Dubonnet. So this is Dubonnet, and I, I actually, they just went to this retro label, which I think is gonna help them sell it, because the other label looks like something my grandmother would have had. This looks cool. I like this a lot. This is Dubonnet, since 1846. Dubonnet Rouge, Grand Apatrif de France. In 1848, according to my notes, which is interesting because it says 1846 on here, maybe it took him two years to win the contest. But in 1848, Sir Joseph Dubonnet. Do you say the T or is it Dubonnet? Dubonnet? Dubonnet. 
Dubonet. Dubonet. Maybe it's Dubonet. Dubonet. Yeah, it could be that. Sir Joseph Dubonet. So, in 1848, Sir Joseph Dubonet won a contest sponsored by the French government uh, to find a way to make quinine more palatable. Quinine is an important anti-malarial medication, but it's extremely intensely bitter. Sir Joseph came up with an aromatized bitter wine apertif, and it caught on. You might be saying, hey, that sounds like a vermouth, and you're right. However, uh, quininated vermouths are really a category all their own, uh, with, which traditionally included Lillet, by the way. These days, Lillet is much closer to Noli Pratt, this kind of vermouth. And so far as I know, Dubonet is the principal origin point for quininated vermouths, so let's taste it. Um, quinas, you would call them, quinas. Um, I have not opened this bottle, apparently. What a very red color. So here we have Dubonet. I hate Dubonet. God, I don't like that flavor. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's, um, it's pretty sweet. I'm not gonna lie. It's almost, can I mean, it's pretty sweet stuff. I don't get a lot of bitterness in it at all. So he was really, I mean, that, that quinine that's in there is very hidden. It tastes, um, like a sweetened wine with a hint of bitterness. Uh, I, I couldn't, not, no tannin style bitterness, just like a little bit of bite. Um, it's pretty limited. All right, there's the Dubonet. I don't have a lot to say about it. I was hoping for, I mean, honestly, I don't I don't sit around drinking Dubonet that often, so I wasn't really, I didn't have much expectation. I, I thought it was gonna be much more quinine-y. It wasn't very quinine-y. Let's keep it in France though, and move on to Ricard. Ricard. Yeah, you say it like that, right? You have to say, Ricard is a pastis. It's actually uh, apparently the first pastis, which I'm gonna define in a moment. It came to market in 1932, 17 years after the French absinthe ban went into effect, and largely its emergence is a response to that. Pastis are licorice flavored liqueurs, and though they might wind up tasting vaguely similar to absinthe, uh, there's, there's a lot of difference. Firstly, they contain no wormwood. Secondly, they derive their anise flavor from a different source, usually star anise versus the green anise uh, that is used in absinthe. They're lower in proof than most absinths, uh, bottled at around 40% ABV, and they're sweetened, as all liqueurs are. They definitely have to have sugar in them. So why is Ricard an aperitif? Well, it's not sweet enough to be a digestive, I guess, and also tradition in marketing holds that it's to be drank before a meal, and therefore it's an aperitif. I feel like I should level with you guys at this point as well. There's not a lot of rules here. <laughs> By and large, an aperitif is an aperitif, because it's an aperitif. That's it. It either is or isn't, you know? I mean, it should be dry, but if someone sold it as an aperitif, it's an aperitif. Let's have a taste of Ricard uh, now. I, I have had Ricard, um, neat, and it was not in a long time. It has this sort of straw color. None of the green of its grandpa absinthe. Gives you the same nose though. It smells exactly like absinthe as soon as you smell it. Woo! It smells like a box of Good and Plenty's. Very strong. Very. Now I'm thinking about Good and Plenty's. I fucking love Good and Plenty's, by the way. Um, let me go buy some Good and Plenty's after I shoot this. I think. I'm gonna go get some Good and Plenty's. Oh, that's actually really nice. It is sweet, but not like very sweet. It's a lot sweeter than absinthe would be neat. It, it's a lot less bitter as a result as well. Um, that might also be a function of the lack of wormwood. Wormwood is really bitter. It doesn't taste like, um, wormwood does not taste like anise at all. Wormwood just tastes like bitterness. It's like a gentian almost. So it's sweet. Um, it's possible if you don't spend a lot of time drinking straight spirits, you might not think it's very sweet. Or if you don't drink absinthe, you wouldn't think it's very sweet, but it's sweet. It's like absinthe after you've added the sugar and then some, I would say. Strong licorice flavor. That's it. We're pretty one note. Sweet and licorice. It's like a licorice candy with some some heat, you know, with some boozy, vaporous kinds of uh, volatile compounds going on. You know, it lets you know it's there. It's 40%. Kind of right out your nose. Yeah. Ricard. I should explain that I chose to focus on Ricard um, above other pastises. Because when, for me, just culturally, when I hear aperitif, I have an immediate association with France and Italy. But the concept of an aperitif is not unique to that region, and neither is the concept of a pastis, or an anise-flavored spirit or liqueur. Though Ricard emerges as a response to the absinthe ban, as does Pernod's own pastis, absinthe itself may have been derived by French and Swiss exposure to ouzo, 
via silk trade with Greece in the early half of the 1800s. Ouzo is an anise-flavored liqueur from Greece that is traditionally enjoyed as an aperitif, and it shares a heritage with Levantine Arak, another anise spirit enjoyed as an aperitif, which may predate absinthe depending on who you ask. For my purposes here, a single anisette makes sense to me, and we're gonna leave it at that, and because I'm when I think aperitif, I think France, I think Ricard, and Ricard is the way to go. Let's talk about Campari. Campari is a bitter aperitif that was actually invented in 1860 by Gaspar Campari in Novara, Italy. I think technically I should say on the Italian peninsula because from my reading, the Kingdom of Italy wasn't officially unified until 1861, though not Rome. They got on board in 1870. But then my reading on this topic is limited and what I know about the history of Italian unification is next to nil, so I better just leave it alone. Uh, Campari is famously red. I mean, it is super red, and if you ever go to a Campari event, uh, everything is very, very red. There's red lights, it's red. They do a hard on the red. They love the red. This red color was originally derived from carmine dye, carmine dye, produced by crushing uh, cochineal insects. <laughs> that actually ended worldwide in 2006, uh, so not very long ago. Campari is a bit different everywhere you go. Uh, though, with different ABV strengths available in various countries around the world. Because they got bottling plants all over, and I bet if we peeled that back a bit, we would find that natural carmine thing finally coming to an end in 2006 was like at one last holdout bottling plant. You know, like that basically that was already over for a long time, but there was just that one last place that was like keeping it like, nope, that's all the net, so we still make it naturally somewhere. Uh, and then finally it was over. I don't know, I could be wrong. Campari is bitter and most people would say orangey in flavor, but like most of these things, Campari keeps its recipe a closely guarded secret. So we can't say. Actually, supposedly only three people on Earth can say, as the word is that only three people know the whole recipe, but also further, who those three people are is kept secret. That seems pretty extreme, but also Campari has been around an awful long time and they've ridden out some tempestuous times. I'm betting they arrived at this arrangement for good reason. I can't really talk about Campari without also mentioning Aperol, though. Aperol comes along later, though. It was invented in 1919 by Luigi and Silvio Barberi, but it didn't really catch on until after the Second World War. You may be surprised to learn that these days, Aperol is actually owned by Campari. Uh, roughly the same kind of color, same bitter aperitif sort of idea. You figure if you buy them out, it's to kill the products, right? Well, no, because at the end of the day, they are really not the same. Aperol is only 11% ABV, generally significantly less, like less than half the ABV of Campari, depending on where you are in the world. And where I am in the world, uh, this is 24% alcohol. So it's less bitter. And even though they are bottled with the same sugar content in the bottle, that reduced bitterness overall makes this one seem a little bit sweeter. Still, uh, it's decidedly an aperitif. So I'm going to taste them both now and compare them a bit. I couldn't decide if I want to put them on the rocks or something like that, but I think we just have them neat. What the heck? There's a little Campari. And a little bit of Aperol. Campari, here we go. Even the smell is bitter. It's nice in the mouth, though. I like it. It's, um, it actually is pretty sweet at the top there. Uh, sweet and maybe that's orange, but like a Seville, like a, a bergamot bitter orange. And then after you swallow, like a long time after you swallow, the bitterness kind of comes up. You can feel the volume rising as you get this very herbal, rooty um, gentian, I think, kind of bitterness. Like it's just flat, like, you know, like hitting that nerve. Makes your mouth water. I like it with a little club soda. I like it cold. I like it on the ice, usually. I've never really drank it neat, to be honest. But, um, I mean, I have, but it's just not, I don't, I don't drink it neat, to be honest. Uh, but it's interesting to try it this way. Let's just finish this off. Yeah, bitter oranges. That's mainly what I get. Like very bitter oranges. Bitter and bitter oranges. Not like oranges that have been made bitter, but bitter oranges. Orange, and then also, additionally, earthy bitterness, root bitterness. And sweetness. And then here the Aperol. Uh, Aperol, of course, famous for the Aperol Spritz, which is another famous aperitif. Now this smells, oh, what a lovely smell. You know what this smells like? This smells like when my wife makes me go with her to, um, what's that store? Well, in the before times, not anymore. We haven't been in many, many months, but what's that store that she likes? Uh, anthropology. This smells like walking into anthropology. That's what that smell is. It smells like oranges and citrus and just like sweet, lovely things, maybe even honeysuckle a little bit. 
way more drinkable. I mean, this just tastes like an orange liqueur. Way easier to drink it's neat than this. There's, I mean, honestly, I, I, I'm screwing myself up here because my palate's a little bit of a wreck from the Campari. I can't really detect any bitterness in the Aperol at all. It really does strike me as being basically an orange liqueur. Let's just drink it until it tastes bitter again. It's a very candy kind of orange finish too. Not in a bad way. It kind of reminds me a little bit of those, uh, those like, you know, 99 cent candy orange slices you get at the gas station. I like my candies. All right. Uh, sweet. Orange. I get no bitterness. I get none. I gotta say though, I, I think that if you're trying to, if you know, if when the, the, the COVID is over and you're gonna have like a huge get together and you wanna really split to it or go all the way, uh, have a huge t long table with all of your guests and you're basically, you're living the life of um, a stock footage family and there's all smiles and slow motion bottle pouring and you've got a lot of people and, and you don't know who's there. I think if you wanna do an aperitif, I don't know, man, a straight Italian, bitter aperitif. I might go with the Aperol because this is going to be much more approachable for everybody. Um, have the Campari. It's, it's much more, much more gusto. <laughs> uh, traditional as well, I think. But this is super easy to drink. I mean, this is just like a sweet orange liqueur with just like a hint of bitterness. A hint. You don't have to acclimate and learn to like that. This one, I, I love Campari, but it does take, you know, not everybody likes it. My wife doesn't like it at all. She doesn't want that or anything with anise in it. She doesn't want any licorice. Um, she has not come around on either of those things yet, so. And I should also uh, add that Campari and Aperol are both frequently enjoyed as a spritz. In fact, that's probably the most common way to enjoy them as an aperitif. It's a combination, you know, a combination of the bitter liqueur of your choice, lice, some club soda, uh, traditionally maybe a bubbling wine, like a Prosecco or a Champagne, add a twist and you are in heaven. It's delicious. It's a wonderful thing to enjoy. Up next, I'm talking about aperitifs that are enjoyed in the UK and Ireland. In the UK, Ireland, and Spain, of course, sherry and Madeira, the dry varieties, have long been utilized as a before dinner aperitif. Sherry is a fortified wine, so it's a lot like a vermouth, but it's not aromatized. And it's got a deep, long history that's way too much to go into here. Uh, wine has been produced on the Iberian Peninsula since at least 200 BCE. In the 700s, during the years of Moorish rulership, distillation was introduced and thereabouts wine started getting fortified with distilled wine. And what would become known as sherry has its roots. It's actually interesting. When Iberian Peninsula was controlled by Moors, um, they changed the name and the name got mangled into sherry. And that's how you get the name sherry. It comes from Z-E-R-R-Y or whatever you know, human is. That, by the way, is an extremely abbreviated version of Sherry history. I am glossing over basically all of it because this is not an episode about Sherry and its history, so forgive me. Madeira, which I mentioned before, is a fortified wine from Portugal, uh, specifically the islands of Madeira. Uh, Production-wise, the main difference is that Madeira is heated during the aging process. Dry examples of either make for fine aperitifs. I do not have examples of all of the types, but I do have this Tio Pepe Fino Sherry. Very, it's a Palomino Fino, if that makes a difference. Very dry. And uh, this Madeira, Rainwater Madeira, uh, which is medium dry. Much, it's less dry than, way less dry than this. You know, honestly, it's hard to find a really dry Madeira where I live, so. I think people, it's hard to find a Madeira where I live, but the heck am I kidding? <laughs> uh, so let's taste this and that now. Um, and I'm going to use, these I've decided are sherry glasses. I don't know why. I don't know if they are or aren't, but I've decided that they are, so what the hell, let's go. Uh, so here goes my Tio Pepe Palomino Fino. And this is my Rainwater Madeira. Port is not um, a, an aperitif, by the way. Port is always sweetened and is, is sweet. It's definitely, it's enjoyed as a digestive frequently. What a wonderful, ooh, what a lovely smell. Both of these have such wonderful aromas. This one, you can smell the sweetness uh, when you add the sugar to the oak and the raisin, like it just smells raisiny. This one, you still get that raisiny smell, but much drier. It's almost like it's, uh, well, it probably is white grapes. All right, here we go. Our dry Tio Pepe Fino. That is dry. <laughs> that is very dry. It's nice. It, it, it is very dry. Actually, I should have been using it as a palate cleanser between some of these other guys. What, what is that? What is that opening note? Earthy. It opens up earthy definitely like dirt that turns slowly into um, sweetened desiccated grapes, otherwise known as raisins. Um, and then eventually into a very mildly 
nutty flavor. I would say that's nutty. I would say that's a nutty flavor. I like that. I like that a lot. I can definitely see that being an excellent aperitif. And a little glass of that before dinner, you know. It has a very lingering aftertaste, but it's like a very clear one. I'm trying to put a finger on it. It is, unless I'm just smelling this, it could be. Yeah, maybe I am. No, it has a very clear, lightly bitter, not bitter, lightly earthy, earthy aftertaste that I, I like. It's really good for cleansing the palate. That's actually it's kind of perfect for that. It replaces what was in your mouth. All right, let's talk about Rainwater Madeira. Is Rainwater Madeira a aperitif? I think it is. Um, I'm actually not 100% sure on that. This one might be indigestive. Let's find out. Pretty sweet. I don't think it's sweet enough to be a digestive though. I think it's an aperitif. It smells good. <laughs> I'm giving you such wonderful tasting notes. It's good. <clears throat> a little sideways on me there. <laughs> you get this, um, like grapes, but like less sweet than grapes and a bit of oak, a little bit of bitterness, um, less sweet than fresh grapes, but not unsweetened. I mean, it's pretty sweet. It's not syrupy, it's not port, but yeah, it was nice. Well, since we're finishing everything today, why not? Uh, I mentioned before that I would do a rundown on a few of the bottles from House because they're aperitifs and also hey, they're sponsoring this episode, so um, it seems appropriate, right? So I got Bitter Clove, Peach Passion Fruit, and Ginger Yuzu right here. Um, I've had these before, so I know what my preference is for these, uh, and just, it's usually on the rocks. I just like them on the rocks. Everything I've had from house is great that way. Uh, so I'm just gonna set up three glasses, crack some ice, and taste these on the rocks, uh, because I've been drinking all these other ones neat, and I, my mouth wants coldness. Um, it just does, dang it. So let's crack a little ice. So let's set them up. Uh, this one will be Bitter Clove. This one will be the Peach Passion Fruit. And this one will be the Ginger Yuzu, which I actually don't think I have had this one. Here we go. Bitter Clove. Totally clear, which is nice to know. You can work with that, right? You can put that into certain cocktails. I love that. That is super good. That's delicious. It's a great nose. It's hard to detect. Wine. I smell wine. Like white wine. But whatever. Taste. It opens with a mild sweetness. Resolves into a kind of tongue-biting bitterness that comes in like clove bitterness. And then the bitterness subsides, but the taste of the cloves lingers. It's very nice, it's really enjoyable. Ooh, and then it comes back for like a second act there as it oxygenates in your mouth. Very um, pleasant. Clove can easily be overdone. I I'm not always a fan of clove, but I like the way this worked out. It has a real, um, kind of a baking spice vibe. Light overall, the whole thing is light. Totally works as an aperitif. Very sophisticated. This is peach passion fruit. That's delicious. That's super good. I love that. That was like cheating. <laughs> it's just so, um, I like the passion fruit flavor. I like the peach. It's just wonderful the way it, uh, it's very approachable. I mean, it doesn't, this one, oh, you gotta think. You're like, oh, that makes me think about things. This one turns your brain off. This one is just like, hey, I'm delicious. How's it going? Um, it's not sweet, but it is fruity um, and citrusy and just bright. And it's like your toes in the sand on the beach, and it's just it's great. I never would have known that peach and passion fruit were a great pairing until I had this, but hey, it turns out that they are. Very bright, very light, perfect aperitif. And obviously it's peachy and passion fruity. I think it's peach first, I don't know. No, it's passion fruit first, and then the peach is the last part. It comes in with that passion fruit, which I don't know if passion fruit's bitter, but it has like a very strong flavor. And then it resolves the passion fruit finally Volume turns down, what's left is this kind of lingering peach flavor that kind of rides out the evolution. So this is the ginger yuzu. Woo! 
That's fun. Boy, that's... What does that taste like? God, that tastes like something I used to drink a long time ago. It just reminds me of a soft drink I was really into. I don't know what it was, though. Well, it's dry. Very... Um, honestly, I, I get nothing right away. I get just, like, cold water. Uh, that suddenly, all of a sudden, it's like, Hello, ginger! <laughs> it turns up. And then uh, you get a little bit of that ginger fire for a second. And then when that subsides, what's left is this sweet uh, citrus yuzu thing which is a little bit different than most of the citrus I have because uh, yuzu is its own thing. I would say it's similar to, but not the same as like a lemongrass, actually. I like that. Kind of has a little bit of tingle in it. Those were our house tastings. So while far from exhaustive, I feel like this was a pretty okay overview of aperitif styles and maybe a little bit of history and that there's really no, I hope there's no glaring holes in this. Also, I want to add that there's a large number of cocktails which are regarded as aperitifs in their own rights. Um, usually they draw on some of the ingredients you saw here, actually. So Negronis, you know, your Negroni is going to have Campari in it, maybe Aperol, but probably not. Negroni should have Campari. Negroni's gonna have, your Negroni is going to have Campari in it, Maracanos, Campari. Martinis are going to pull from Vermouth. Manhattans are going to pull from Vermouth. French 75 is an aperitif. Uh, it's, you know, I didn't even mention it really, but Champagne is a classic aperitif. French 75 is an aperitif. I mean, honestly, so is a Tom Collins. You know, um, a Pimm's Cup is an aperitif for sure. Uh, gin and tonic, definitely an aperitif. Any kind of a spritz is an aperitif. Any kind of a long drink, a Collins, something like that is an aperitif. I mean, technically, technically, the cocktail, the concept of a cocktail, like an old fashioned, is technically an aperitif. But I think if you're having an old fashioned as an entree to dinner, you are setting yourself up for a hell of a night because you're probably going to have a couple of dinner and you're going to have a dessert. Oh boy. You better take a cab. Let's just leave it at that. I want to thank House again for sponsoring this episode right now. So thank you, House, very much. Uh, right now, you're going to get 15% off of your order when you use my code and the link below. Uh, and you should order. It's it's great stuff. Uh, lately, I've been big on that peach passion fruit. I don't know, though. I might be swinging back to the uh, the bitter clove. I was really into that. That might be, you know, as a seasonal thing. I, I, I was, peach summer, I was really into the peach. I think now it's winter... I want to sit by the fire with that, that bitter clove. That's really good. The ginger yuzu, I've, I always had it for the first time and I'm still warming up to that. You'll find me on Twitch at twitch.tv slash Greg from HTD. I do live stuff there, live stuff from the bar. I have a tabletop role-playing group. We get together every Tuesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern where you're playing Cyberpunk Red currently, which is super fun. I have a Instagram at how to drink. I am on um, Twitter at how to drink. And I have a Patreon at patreon.com slash how to drink. Order yourself some house. You won't be disappointed. You're going to love it. That's the show, guys. I uh, Normally, you only have one little aperitif before, before a meal. I had to have them all, and so now I'm way after the meal. I'm way after the meal. I would be remiss um, to my lord and master YouTube if I did not advise you to uh, like, comment, and subscribe. I feel like such a dumb dumb saying that stuff, and even more, I, I'm starting to feel like an idiot even asking you guys to watch other videos of how to drink, but... I have been making this show for a long time. There's a lot of how to drink out there. If you're new to the series, I mean, I've been doing this for five years. You got a lot of catching up to do. Here are some places you could start. Uh, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the show. I'll be back very soon with another episode. Good night and good luck. I'm done hitting cut, 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 cut.